Okay, let's let's start with a little bit of conceptual stuff. Um, so, this is a device for testing colorblindness. Anyone here colorblind? Yeah. Okay. What for? Okay. Well, here we go. Here's a great design. <laughs> no, I will call you out. Uh, you're, you're a little bit colorblind. You're red green, but just a standard. Yeah. There's always there's, there's always somebody in every class. It's always guys. Uh, but you guys are normal. Yeah, yeah, exactly. White guys especially. Uh, very common white guys. And um, so these these tests are quite common. And uh, uh, I was using this one with my son. Uh, that's why there are animals here, right? So you could just say, find the animals and go through. And I knew my son wasn't colorblind because the Mendelian genetics makes it impossible. But <laughs> I was already knew. But it was a fun thing to do, and he, he thought it was interesting. So um, so yeah, there, there are some animals here. I think there's a bear up there, right, or a Bruin. Rather, I would call it no, at least one deer, but uh, it's like a deer and a cow. A deer and a cow. Yeah, deer and a cow superimposed, right? Exactly. And they mix in the purple. Um, and yeah, there's various things some bunnies and squirrels and, and yeah, wolves. Uh, See? You guys are wrong. This thing is always a hit. I love it. <laughs> I'm get you guys to babysit my son sometimes. Uh, oh, I, I yeah, they're e I think E.T. is in the corner down here. <laughs> yeah, well, anyway, so what, what's the point I want to make with this? This is a test, right? And it's extremely diagnostic. Uh, it has almost no failure rate. If someone is colorblind, they can't see stuff here. It, the, the hues and the intensities, the saturations, are planned out right so that the shapes become invisible to people with different forms of colorblindness. And with this one diagram, you can diagnose, I think, three different common forms of colorblindness. And um, so, you know, the bear is invisible to Josh, and, and or mostly invisible, and uh, and it's very diagnostic. You can't fake it. You can't find the bear. There's just no way to do it. And if you if you don't have colorblindness, the bear is there. It's just like, how can you not see the bear? Uh, uh, there are phenomena in the world that are like this, where there are easy tests that produce discrete outcomes, and there's no uncertainty about the outcome about it. Some things are like this. Unfortunately, most of our science isn't. Uh, and yet, there's this real psychological need to develop diagnostic discrete tests with binary outcomes. And I think a lot of the, the cultural evolution of statistics in the sciences themselves, not so much in stats departments, is about fulfilling that wish. It's the wish fulfillment of having basically colorblindness tests for whether your hypothesis is true or false. Um, so uh, this is, I put this in this part of the course to sort of say, well, look, we haven't talked about p-values. And the reason isn't because this is a Bayesian course, because you can do significance testing with posterior probability just as well as you can do it with frequent test sampling distributions. You can. People do do that. Uh, Bayesians in psychology in particular are really big on null hypothesis testing with Bayes factors is what they say. Um, I'm down on all that stuff, and that's why I don't teach it. It's not a Bayesian attitude. It, instead, it's the recognition that, look, scientific evidence is probabilistic. It's not like colorblindness, uh, where it comes out discrete like that, where there's some threshold. And, yeah, you pass the test or you don't. Evidence is massively uncertain. What we have are probability distributions. And in all statistical frameworks, Bayesian or not, probability encodes uncertainty. It uses different metaphors to do it, but that's what it always does. And translating that probability into certainty is something you can only do through some other routine. It's not part of the machine itself, right? It's a heuristic that's, that's imposed on it. So that's why I don't, I don't teach this, because I don't want to encourage you to do that. I want to encourage you to embrace the uncertainty. Give it a warm hug. Uh, get used to it. And communicate as much of it as you can to your colleagues so that they can build on it honestly, right? instead of losing uncertainty at every step. Um, so let me run through. I think this is it's useful to do uh, before we get into the material today. Run through all the reasons that p-values are basically the worst tool you can use for whatever you want to do. Uh, and... So if you're interested in estimating an effect, um, deciding whether the effect is real or not based upon the p-value is worse than using the maximum likelihood estimator, which would be like the map estimator with black priors, or just using the full posterior, which is what I've been advising you to do. That's the estimate, additional on the model and data. Uh, the p-value is some additional procedure uh, where you're deciding, and people do this all the time, that there's really no effect, that is the estimate is zero uh, because this arbitrary threshold is not in 
right? And 5% is magical thinking, right? There's nothing about 5% that matters. Except that we have five fingers because there was this stitch that crawled out of the sea that had five bony rays in its fins, right? And uh, that's pretty much it. I think that's the true story, actually. We can, we can blame lungfish uh, for the 5% convention. Uh, damn fish. And uh, so if you're interested in estimation, look at the posterior distribution. Or if you're doing frequentist estimation, look at the sampling distribution. That's what you care about. Um, beyond, that's the accuracy issue, conditional on the model. Uh, uh, if you're interested in deciding uh, how you should behave based upon an estimate, then things get interesting. But uh, there's this whole field of decision analysis, which was mentioned in, in Chapter 2, right? Or was it Chapter 3? Now I forget. Uh, I think it was Chapter 3. Um, yeah, it was the end of Chapter 3. And I didn't have time to talk about it much in lecture, where in order to do this, you need to, you need to decide what the costs and benefits of different kinds of mistakes are. And that would be a formal decision analysis. And then you could decide how you should behave conditional on certain estimates or a certain posterior distribution. And there's a big, interesting field about that. Uh, so in this context, the thing about using p-values to make these decisions about whether we're going to behave as if this is a hypothesis is correct or not is that it's uncalibrated always. There are no explicit costs and benefits, and the 5% is exogenously determined and arbitrary because of a lung fish. Right? Uh, so I don't think there's anything wrong with doing decision analysis, uh, but you should be explicit about it and realize that when you're deciding to act as if the effect is actually zero, you're doing an extremely naive form of decision analysis. Right? And I want to talk to you that way, so you can't blame yourself. You shouldn't blame yourself. There's a tradition here that's evolved in the sciences as wish fulfillment. Um, if you want to do prediction, well, we, we did all that stuff last week, right? I probably don't have to reiterate this. Uh, there's nothing about 5% that optimizes anything, guarantees anything. Uh, there are uh, different and successful prediction frameworks. I taught you one based upon information theory. There are others as well. Um, those are justifiable in a way that P isn't. P is not, the, the p-value uh, uh, procedure is not derived to optimize prediction. Uh, and the 5% is definitely not derived to optimize anything, right? It's just an arbitrary convention. So all this applies to confidence intervals as well. And I have to say this because in, in, I think in psychology right now, there's this idea of what they call the new statistics is using confidence intervals instead of p-values. But they still look at the end, like if the confidence interval includes zero, no, no effect. Right? It's the same thing. Don't do that either. It's just a different language for describing the same stuff. Uh, so don't give in to that temptation as well. Boundaries aren't what's interesting. The continuous change in plausibility is what's interesting, if that makes sense. So you kind of ease into this uh, as we go. Let me give you an example. Um, and uh, this is one of my favorite ones. I'm just, I, I like it so much I tweeted it this week. I think it's the first time I've used that verb in public. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, this is a great paper for 2004 uh, by Hauer. And uh, Hauer is a, a statistician of largely traffic safety, uh, which is a big deal. So this is cars are the main threat to human life in North America. And some of you knew this. Not so much in Davis. Here's bicycles. But, uh, so this is a great paper because what he does is he goes through uh, three different historical cases of hypothetical uh, questions about changing traffic law in cases where accepting the null hypothesis because P was greater than 0 0.05 led to increased human mortality. Uh, and, and the problem in all cases was that the studies had low power. Another way to think about that is the posterior distribution was very broad. Uh, and, but it was broad enough to include zero, but also really big values were plausible too. But people ignore the big side. But from your perspective, here's zero, right? Flip the paper around and here's big values. Um, so let me give you table one from this paper. It's great. Uh, the first story focuses on right turn on red, which is this thing we do in North America that is done almost nowhere else in the world. Why? Because it's crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. This is how pedestrians die, is that we make it legal for cars to take a right turn on red whenever they feel like it. Uh, uh, it is a bad idea. So New York City is saying, right, because uh, New York City doesn't allow this. Isn't that right, Paul? Uh, uh, and uh, so it used to be illegal in all of North America. Uh, and then during the um, uh, the oil embargo, during Carter's presidency, I believe, uh, there was all this pressure to say, well, there are these people sitting idling at red lights. What if we let them take a turn to use up that fuel? Well, the gas prices spiked, and people did crazy stuff about it. And, and uh, so various states and counties started um, exploring with the idea of allowing right turns on red so there was less idling at stop signs. And... Uh, you can see here some of the count data that was that, that came out of this. You compare the same intersections before and after allowing right turns on red. 
in different categories, zero fatal crashes to zero fatal crashes, 43 <laughs> personal injuries before to 60 after, 69 person injured, uh, persons injured before, 72 after. In every case, the bad stuff goes up. But it's a short period of study, and none of these differences are statistically significant at the arbitrary lone fish threshold right, of 5%. And so study after study in North America, because none of them were cooperating, it was each little county doing it by themselves, had low power, and all of them concluded that right turn on red was great. And then they made it law, and now we're stuck with it, and we're killing pedestrians every day in this country as a consequence. You're welcome for this sad story. <laughs> I know you guys are giving me this like, oh, oh my god, this class used to be fun. <laughs> I've got a bunch of these. I have like the, the file of statistical horrors <laughs> if you want some more. But so there are two more. I encourage you to take a look at this paper. Just just Google the uh, how our accident analysis and prevention um, and uh, right turn on red. You'll find it. Uh, Two other stories, too. One with speed limits, um, and I the other one with curves, I think, putting in curves. Yeah, fun. How short is the red Oh, these, are, these were like month uh, trials. Uh, and a lot of it is rural counties were trying these. And you've got a rural inter intersection and a month long trial. And in every case, the estimate is in the direction of saying it's more dangerous. But the confidence interval was wide. Uh, and these differences actually underestimate the harm in the long run, because they're missing the occasional actual fatality uh, which arises. Uh, so it's again, it's the thing about confidence intervals is just because it includes zero on one end, it, notice that it also includes really big values on the other end. And the model is saying they're, they're equally plausible. Uh, so uh, you have to pay attention to both sides. Um, it is true. It is a great paper. Uh, I think it's, it's really a jewel. Um, OK. Uh, so. What should you do? Well, you guys know I'm, I'm hesitant uh, about horoscopic advice, uh, but that's the best I can sort of do in, in a class of this kind. Here are things that I think I can get behind for ordinary sorts of regression uh, models, the kinds we've looked at so far. And I call these heuristics. They're just rules of thumb. When your domain knowledge says do something else, do something else. Uh, you know your science. And um, you can almost always beat my vague advice. Uh, Instead of asking whether or not the effect is real, assume it's real and estimated. That's what your model actually does. Uh, so you can address it that way. And then after the fact, it's a separate question, how should you behave conditional on that? In basic science, usually we just like to construct a posterior distribution and pass it on to others, right, so others can build. So for example, in the right turn on red literature, if they had done that, instead of recording zero as the effect, which some of the papers did, uh, uh, which wasn't the difference. The difference is not zero in that table, right? But that's what they said. There is no effect. Um, there was an effect. Uh, uh, just because P is greater than 5% doesn't mean there, that the estimate changed. The estimate was still greater than zero. If you communicate that, you pile up the evidence. If all of those papers that found no uh, significant difference had just presented uh, the posterior distribution, all of them could have pooled it in a meta-analysis and found out that, wow, across uh, the country, there's massive evidence that right turn on red is dangerous and should not be allowed. Um, similar thing happened with speed limit increases in the 80s. Uh, a bunch of states were allowed to increase uh, the speed limits, and, and they did these short-term, low-power studies, and it seemed fine. And, but if they'd aggregated them, uh, they would have found out it was a terrible idea. And we're still, we still have high speed limits, actually. Um, so uh, zoom an effect and estimate it. Um, if you must make a decision, decision analysis is a thing you can do. Think about the New York blizzard again, right? Uh, they, they got criticized for not being accurate, but accuracy wasn't the issue there. And they were trying to protect the public, and so they had to overreact. Uh, maybe they over-overreacted. They probably didn't need to shut down the subways. The New York subways couldn't withstand a nuclear explosion, probably. Right? Everything else would be leveled, but the subways would still be running. <laughs> Manned by rats, but <laughs> they'd be running. <laughs> and, uh, so it's a great subway system, that's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> and, Aside from the spreading epidemic, if some of you know what I mean. <laughs> but, uh, so, um, with, in the context of any particular model, imagine how the estimates can mislead you. They're always missing variables that you may not have thought about. And if you have good enough uh, domain knowledge about your system, you may be able to think about what they are. Um, and maybe you couldn't measure them, or maybe you didn't think of them ahead of time. Either way, uh, make a proper accounting of how, if you had those variables, and if the world were different, how do you think it would affect your results? Uh, and you can often do, if you have good scientific knowledge of your system, you can do better than just anxiety here. You can make predictions about the direction it should change things. So sometimes you can figure out, for example, okay, so we didn't measure the following variable, uh, but
but but uh, any if any bias induced by that variable would be in favor of my hypothesis. So my results are conservative, right? This is what you want to be able to argue. Uh, sometimes it'd be the other way, and then you just have to be honest and say, yeah, if that other variable is important, then I'm screwed. Uh, and that's just how it is. But um, think about how you got your sample. Uh, remember the manatees and bombers. Uh, when things become a sample, typically they're a subset of the whole population of the phenomenon. Um, so I was I was in a seminar yesterday uh, where I, I brought up this selection effect in terms of graduate student admissions, uh, uh, which is a conversation I have every year about this time with people. So it turns out in admitted grad students in PhD programs and, and actually undergrads, um, there's a negative correlation between GPA and standardized testing scores, uh, nearly always. And in many places, many countries, it's not just a North American effect. Um, it's very strong in PhD students. Uh, and so people will say, oh, this tells us something about the nature of intelligence. They're either good at coursework or good at standardized tests, whatever that means. And it doesn't. Uh, it's a side effect of selection. So the way you get admitted to graduate school is that the sum of those things passes the threshold. Uh, this is basically how it goes. It doesn't have to be a perfect sum, but there's some largely additive function that produces a score, and if that score passes the threshold, you can get into graduate school. Uh, the grad studies here actually provide thresholds at which they will allow programs to admit you, so this is a rule. And as a consequence of that, there are, there are very few people who are excellent at both of those things and really top them both out. So the most, the easiest way to get in is to be excellent at one of them. Uh, and that creates a negative correlation in the selected sample. But in the population as a whole, they're positively correlated. Right? Does that make sense? This is a fantastic thing. It's called Beckman's paradox in statistics. Uh, uh, it, it comes up all the time. The general lesson to take away here is just think about how you got your data and, and what cases might have been missed. Uh, could values of predictors have influenced the probability that data ended up in your sample? And if it can, you can model that. It's not the end of the world. This is the standard thing in polling. Right? Who answers telephones? Boring people with nothing better to do. Right? <laughs> And uh, I only answer phone calls from my spouse. That's like the only person I will ever answer phone calls from, literally. And uh, so maybe eventually my son, but uh, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> but uh, uh, So there's this problem in polling of dealing with selection bias. Uh, polling samples are predominantly white and old, and those people answer phones more and uh, have landlines. So you have to do sample adjustments to deal with this, and it's a big topic. Um, uh, in polling, uh, in the statistics of polling. Lots of things have this. It's not the end of the world, but you need to think about it. So again, the, the bombers are like that too. That's a statistical problem you can deal with when you imagine that the probability of bombers in your sample, well, it must not have been shot down. Right? And that flips the meaningfulness of a lot of things about the location of damage. Uh, manatees, likewise, right? To be able to see the manatee, uh, it needs to have not been killed. Um, model structure, all your inferences are conditional on model structure. Imagine different structures. And, for now, this just means different linear models. Um, but as we move along, I think you'll be able to see there are other things to think about, too. I'll, I'll have an example later today, a, a verbal one I want to throw at you, but leaving the mathematics aside for the moment, of a case where these linear models aren't really capable of describing a phenomenon. You already understand. Uh, so you need to expand beyond it. Um, good rule to always keep in mind, fitting is easy. Prediction is hard. Right, uh, right now, it might, sometimes it might seem like fitting is hard because you know your computer fights you. Right, you get those scary red messages in R, something about v min finite difference value. Right, that's my favorite one. And uh, so it seems like it's hard, but this is actually the easiest part. It's easy to encrypt a sample of data using a model into a different set of numbers called the posterior distribution. That is actually the easy part of this job. Robots do it. Predicting the future is tough. Uh, both because uh, models overfit. That's the first problem. We spent a lot of time last week on that. Uh, secondly, because models are never correct in the sense that the real natural processes generating data are always different from our schematics, uh, uh, the models that we use. Um, and the future, the, the phenomenon we're studying may be changing. It may not be uniformitarian. Uh, and again, in, in the social sciences and biological sciences, it's easy to imagine that because we work at a very high level of description in population biology. Many of you are population biologists. Uh, so the, the nature of the phenomenon is actually moving out from under your feet. And you might have gotten the model trained correctly the first time, but then, damn it, the climate change. Right? Everything changes now. Uh, you know, or, or rats invade your field site, or <laughs> whatever it is. 
Uh, plotting is is really essential and I, and I think underemphasized in introductory statistics. Uh, in advanced statistics, it's not. Um, uh, it's emphasized a great deal. But in introductory statistics, there's this overemphasis on reading tables of coefficients. And I I hope I've convinced you guys by now. I bored you to death with it because it's like a mantra with me that uh, it's hard to understand a model from tables of coefficients. So there's just marginal posterior distributions. There's a lot of information missing. What you need to look at are the implied predictions, and that will automatically take account of all the covariances among those parameters and help you understand things. We're going to spend some more time on that today, as I think it's very important. Now, with interactions, plotting is the only way I can make sense out of them, at least. Uh, it's very difficult otherwise. Um, and then above all, embrace uncertainty. There's a certainty about parameters. There's a certainty about models. Report as much of it as you can to your colleagues so they can build. Right? You don't need to be overconfident. Uh, if science goes the way I hope it does, uh, uh, this sort of thing will become uh, compulsory because we'll make everything uh, easy to replicate. Right? Where this reproducibility movement is a fantastic thing that's going on. When I started grad school, no one was talking about making their work reproducible. And uh, the idea that you would like send in a script with your paper, the first time I did that, the editor was like, I don't want this, <laughs> literally, and uh, like scolded me for sending in my data analysis script. Now there are journals that require it. This is a wonderful thing. And um, with that, I think uh, the idea of being overconfident uh, will fade because you can get called on it really easy, right? And the incentive structure is going to shift. That's my hope. Um, I'm usually wrong, though, so <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe I should hope for the other thing. Um, okay, we're in week five. We're going to move into week six, uh, MCMC next week. And uh, so you've, you've got, in addition to your homework um, uh, for the chapter we're going to finish today, you've, your other homework, if you haven't already, is to install Stan. Uh, here's Stan. <laughs> uh, you'll install the software named after him. This is uh, Stanislaw Ulam, a very famous figure in uh, the history of uh, machine learning and also in, in biology, which is why he's standing by this, this organic molecule. Uh, here did lots of uh, good stuff, um, and uh, so Stan is a, a a programming language that helps you do statistical inference. You're not going to be writing in it directly. The rethinking package hides the guts from you until you want it, and later on you can graduate to writing in it yourself. It looks a lot like the model code you're writing already, though, uh, but with more precision and power. <coughs> so. We're going to use Stan as our Markov chain Monte Carlo engine so we can fit uh, more kinds of models. Uh, we're going to be using this in the second half of the course to do generalized linear uh, and generalized linear mixed models. So get this installed. Go to the mc-stan.org. Find our Stan quick start here. Go there. Find your platform. Get it installed. I'm confident you can do it. You guys do more complicated things all the time. But get it going. There will be some problem, and then I will help you. Right? Uh, we'll figure it out. But this is what you're going to need to do um, starting next week to do the homework, okay? And uh, uh, again, rethinking will kind of fire it up for you once you've got it all installed. The hardest part, as I did it here, is to get a C++ compiler installed. If you're, if you're among the blessed and you are on a, a Unix platform already, you, you probably already have one. Um, but uh, Macs don't come anymore, right, with the compiler installed. That's right. And so you've, you've got to download Xcode. Uh, this will tell you how to do it. When you go to their quick start guide, they'll tell you about that. It's, it's pretty easy. It's free. You don't have to buy anything. And if you're using Ubuntu or something, you've already got what you need, I bet. Um, and on Windows, uh, you'll probably need a compiler. Uh, they'll, they'll give you a link to it as well. That's the hard part, and then the rest is easy. Okay, but again, if there are problems, and there's always somebody whose who's computer's got a gremlin, uh, it's not your fault. Don't engage in self-flagellation. Um, I will help you with it. Okay, and Paul is also very clever with computers out here. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, he denies any skill <laughs> at this. Anyway, do this. This is part of your assignment um, for the weekend. Okay, let's get back into interactions now. So uh, just to remind you where we're, we're going to work on the tulip data as a clean example of an interaction where you have the biological background to understand what's happening. We'll be able to understand the estimates that arise. Uh, blooms. Um, we're going to, these are greenhouse replicates. We have three values of water treatment, three values of shade treatment. These things interact <laughs> because you know plants, right? They need both. Photosynthesis requires light and water, and neither is sufficient by itself. Um, we're going to, we consider two models, the ordinary no interaction model, where we just have main effects of water and shade, and the interaction model, uh, where we multiply the water and shade levels together. So these are continuous interactions. Now. These aren't on off. This isn't like... Be easy to think through um, ruggedness in Africa 
thing that I started with that one because what makes it conceptually easy is that Africa is just an on-off switch, right? It's a dummy variable. So you've got two slopes, and the model estimates exactly two slopes. In a continuous interaction like this, uh, it estimates a continuous change in slope as the product of the of water and shade changes. And so suddenly this is craziness, right? It's hard to see. The equation looks the same. It's constructed the same way, but it's much harder to think through now, and we're going to need plots absolutely to do this. Um, so I think we this is where we had gotten to. Uh, we compared the two models just to show you the interaction model. It's a lot of evidence. It's better. Um, uh, it fits the sample a whole lot better. Uh, but even accounting for the, uh, the flexibility of the model, the increased flexibility of the model, uh, it's still the expected out of sample deviance is a lot better as well. Um, and what I've gotten to show you was uh, if you compare the coefficients of the non-interaction model to the interaction model, they change a lot. Uh, and this is very confusing. And this happens to a lot of people. Um, and uh, uh, it's normal to be confused by what has happened here. You can interpret these coefficients, right? You guys are pros at these, these simple main effect models. You can do it. Um, each of these beta coefficients being in, the, in model 7.6, just being the change in the outcome per unit change in that predictor, right? And the model assumes they don't interact, so you can read them pure and think about prediction that way. You can get good at that, so that's fine. So that's the intro stats reading table thing. It can be done. Um, the interaction model, it's all off. Uh, everything has gone crazy. Uh, now, the, this effect size is doubled. It hasn't. Uh, this one is flipped sign. It hasn't really. Shade is still bad for plants, okay, in this model. Uh, and then you've got an interaction effect, and it's negative. And what does that mean? Because okay, so this thing is negative, we're multiplying it by something, and then it's getting added to a bunch of other stuff. Uh, you can't think through this stuff. Just don't even try. Instead, we're going to make plots. Um, so. Uh, first thing to talk about, though, is this: is come back to the topic of centering and show you that if you center your predictors, you can make a little bit more progress on thinking about the coefficient tables. And I do want to show you this, even though, in general, I want to do it just to kind of explain to you the key point, which is the reason the, the strange changes in estimates on the previous slide arise because these parameters, even though they have the same labels, they don't mean the same thing anymore. The interaction model is different. It has a different probability space, a different model structure. The fact that you reuse the same labels uh, in the model because they're conceptually kind of similar doesn't mean they refer to the same exact things and they can't be interpreted the same way. So I want to walk you through that, try and bring it home, and then we'll talk about plotting, uh, which is the way I really encourage you uh, to figure this stuff out. Um, so to remind you, centering means we take each uh, predictor variable and we just subtract the mean from each value. If you also divide it by standard deviation, you have standardized ones. But I'm not standardizing here to show you that the centering is what does the thing here. You can also standardize if you want. I think that's great. It'll make fitting a lot more reliable here. Uh, uh, but you don't have to do that. Uh, the centering is what causes the effect. So recenter those, refit the models, uh, the two models, the main effect model and the interaction model, but now using these centered predictor variables. So think about what centering has done before we look at the graphs where you see exactly what it's done. Shade had three values, one, two, three. Uh, since it's an experiment, it's all balanced. So the mean was two. So we, we subtract two from every value, and now the values are minus one, zero, and one. Right? Those, are the, those are the shade levels. The same for water. Uh, that's all it's done is just subtracted two from each of the values of the predictors. Um, now we refit the models. We do the coefficient table again. Uh, uh, intercept stays about the same, and in this case, the intercept means the average, uh, this is the average bloom when all the predictors are at their average values. 129 is the average bloom area uh, when all the predictors are at their average values, which are zero. Right? That's what you get out of it. So the intercept is interpretable now. Some people get excited about this. I don't, because I just plot stuff anyway, but uh, that's fine. Um, the main effects stay the same. Uh, almost identical, right? Almost identical estimates uh, within, you know, government work. And uh, 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 we don't care about the residual variation anyway, except that, you know, this is smaller because it's fitting the sample better, right? And the interaction is negative. Uh, and we're going to spend some time talking about that. I think this is still hard to understand in any verbal way. So we're going to still need to plot that. Um, but this is what centering gets you, is it, it makes the main effects behave in a way. They won't always be exactly the same as in the beginning. Here it is because everything's balanced. Uh, that's why they're, they're so similar. 
um, but you'll get these, these effects. So let me unpack for you why this happened a little bit. And the first thing is, let's do a little bit of uh, thinking about the structure of a linear model with an interaction. Um, here's just the likelihood uh, of this interaction model. Um, and you can think about the usual question is, uh, we ask these sort of regression questions, what's the rate of change in the outcome per unit change in a predictor variable? And in a simple linear regression, there's a parameter for that. But in an interaction model, there isn't. I'll say that again. In a, in a simple linear regression with only main effects, there is a parameter, a beta coefficient, which answers this question. What's the change in the outcome per unit change of the predictor? Or in this case, what's the change in bloom size per unit change in water level? Uh, in a linear regression, there's a coefficient for that. That is exactly that answer. And here there isn't, but we can still calculate it. How? Well, that has a definition, and this definition is a derivative. And uh, I know Tez, Tez raised his eyebrow Riley because he, he loves derivatives. <laughs> but uh, Sorry, you, you did the eyebrow thing, man. It's on you. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um, so, No, we, we used to joke. He took my class last quarter. We joked about calculus a lot. But uh, that's why. It's an inside joke. So uh, now it's outside. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So uh, we can calculate the rate of change in mu, which is the expected value of the outcome per, per unit change in w, just by calculating this partial derivative. And uh, chain rule is all you need here. And uh, it is exactly uh, b sub w plus b sub w s s, which is, by no coincidence, that gamma thing from the example on Tuesday. It's what we defined as the rate of change when we change that predictor, is that it depends. It's a model itself. It's a linear model itself that creates the dependency. So the other predictor is in this, and that's what creates the interaction effect. Does this make some sense? We recovered our assumption. Uh, this is what I love about math. It's all totologies, but you still learn stuff from it. I keep saying this, but it's, it's true. Um, and likewise, for the other uh, one, the change in, in blooms per unit change in uh, shade, uh, we can calculate that one, and unsurprisingly, uh, similarly, it's it's BS plus uh, uh, <laughs> yes <laughs> yes BS sorry yes. beta S. Let's avoid that particular linguistic risk. It is beta S plus beta WS times W. And uh, so again, a linear model. Two parameters in both cases are needed to answer the question, plus some assumption about the value of the other predictor variable. And that's why it's weird. So these these parameters don't mean the same thing that they used to. In a, in a simple linear regression, the answers to these questions are just the parameters beta w and beta s, right? Now the answers to these questions, which are what we want to know, is this model. Uh, so how do you deal with this? You plot it. That's what you do. Uh, and there's just no way around it uh, if you want to think about it coherently. Now, but let's, let's say, so why does centering help or appear to help? Um, the meaning of the parameters has changed when you add the interaction. And let me unpack what you uh, learned on the previous slide into this explanation. And centering basically disguises the change in identity by making the mean value of all the predictors zero so that it cancels all those parameters. Uh, and then you're looking at changes at the mean. Um, uh, but it's still just a disguise. The parameters still don't mean the, main th the same thing. And so that's why I think it's dangerous uh, to encourage you to say, like, oh, center your predictors, and then it's all fine. It's not all fine. It's still a trap, a conceptual trap, and you want to you want to plot. So think about this: in a coefficient model without interactions, the change in the outcome, uh, uh, the, the coefficient is a change in the outcome per unit change in predictor. So, like the change in blues per unit change in water, there's a coefficient for that in a simple model without interaction. That same parameter with the same label uh, in an interaction model is the change in the outcome per unit change in predictor when the other predictor is zero. Because then that little linear model, B sub S uh, uh, plus B sub W S times um, water, uh, the only time that will be only that one coefficient is when the predictor is zero. So when you center, you make the mean zero. Uh, and then you get an inference at zero, right? An inference at the mean about the meaning of it. Uh, and so it ends up being the same sort of value. Uh, but it's just a trick, really. It disguises the change in identity. It's still a different entity. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, so let's say that that in a, in a cent with centered predictors, the mean is zero. You coerced it to be that, and that's how it arises. So um, I've gone through all this just to say 
Centering's great. It helps you fit the model better. Um, it'll lead you to be a little less surprised by wild swings and parameter estimates as you transition to an interaction model. Uh, but still, to really understand the, what the model says, you're going to have to always use more than one parameter at a time. Uh, it's just the truth of how these things go. Um, you can make inferences at a particular value, uh, but you want to make inferences across changes in values. And to do that well, uh, we're going to have to do some plotting. Um, so let's take a look uh, uh, last time to look at one of these tables. Here are the actual, uh, the, this is the full marginal posteriors for the interaction model uh, M7.9. Uh, we can think about the identity of these things now, and you can see sort of how they're not really answering the questions you want. Uh, alpha is the mean blooms when water and shade are equal to zero, which here means at their average values. So th that makes this an interpretable value, 129. That's a real thing. In the uncentered one, you, you will have forgotten, but it was alpha was negative, right? which means it's like a black hole tulip that is sucking in tulips for the future or something like that. Right? <laughs> like it owes tulips to the, to the future. Uh, and um, BW, the change in blooms per unit change in water, only when shade equals zero. So then the first thing you ask, well, what if it doesn't equal zero? Okay, well, then you've got to use more than one parameter and deal with the covariance among them, right, to get the confidence interval of it. Uh, and that's not an easy thing to do uh, in your head, and, you, and there's not enough information displayed in this table to do it. Uh, BS, same thing, change in blooms per unit change in shade when water equals zero. BWS is the interaction. It's negative. What does that mean? I encourage you not even to try. There, there are various metaphors you can apply and try to understand it, but I think they're very system specific and different contexts you can get it. Um, so that, but I'm trying to give you horoscopic advice. Uh, in that case, uh, it's plot. So let's, let's transition to that, talking about plotting. Um, I'm fond of a, of a technique called triptychs, uh, which I learned in photography class as an undergraduate. Uh, and uh, the triptych is a classic art presentation where you have three related panels, images, that as a whole create a more satisfying aesthetic effect. Uh, very common in modern photography. Uh, here's my favorite historical triptych. Um, this is Lewis Powell, who's one of the co-conspirators for the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. And he didn't pull the trigger, but uh, he was convicted of conspiracy, which he admitted to because uh, he was a proud southerner fighting the war of northern aggression. And uh, this, these are great photos. You can sort of see the insolence and, and pride in this. And this was shortly before he, he was awaiting his hanging, um, which came like half an hour after these photos were taken. Uh, this is a, a proud young man who felt he was fighting for uh, uh, the rights of his nation. Right? It's, it's, these are really interesting photos. Now, of course, it's, it's dark, right, because he was fighting for something we regard as, I mean, he was a terrorist, right? He was an American terrorist. Um, these are great photos. And you get more from the triptych, right? You learn stuff about him. Uh, and his attitude uh, towards the photographer, too. The middle one's great, where he looks at the photographer and is like, come on, come at me, bro. <laughs> um, so, anyway, so now, art class aside, <laughs> uh, uh, we're going to do this with data. We're going to do this with interaction plots. And the value of the triptych will be you'll get to see the change across panels. And the whole will give you a more aesthetic appreciation about how the model behaves. There will be no American terrorists involved, but uh, uh, you will learn a lot from it. So, um, Let's look at this uh, this way. And I wanted to say, too, there's nothing special about using three. Uh, it's just I think you need at least three, so you can do two extremes and an average. Uh, but you might want to do 20, if you like. Or if you're really good at fancy animated interactive stuff, uh, make something with a slider. Uh, and uh, 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 that'll help you, too. Uh, but the comparison is often good, so more than one panel is nice. So here's how you do it. I'm not going to show you the code to do this, because really, all you do with the code here is... We've done this before. You fix uh, one of the predictors at a certain value, and then you generate predictions um, for the uh, cross values of the predictor on the horizontal. You've been doing this over and over again. Uh, but now we're going to choose different values of the predictor we hold constant and make multiple plots uh, with it at each of those values. So this will construct the triptych. So in this case, we start um, here, in the, here we are in the, at the top of the slide in the upper left. We set water, the centered version of it, at minus 1. So that's the first level of water treatment, the lowest water treatment. We construct uh, the predictions, the counterfactual predictions, across the three levels of shade. Uh, and I've superimposed the data there, the blue points, uh, for only for the plants that were grown at that water treatment. All right, so you can see uh, the ones that apply in that case. Uh, and then I've just plotted the, this is the mu, and it's 95% and it's uh, confidence. Yeah. So you know how to do this in the code. There's nothing new. It's, it's just the, the purpose that's new. Um, then in the middle, we set water to zero. We redo the whole thing. You can use the same code, right? 
Um, and now I've only plotted the raw data for those plants that were grown at the middle water treatment, where water, centered version of water is equal to zero. You with me? Does make sense? Uh, and then once I get done with them all, I'll explain what's going on here. This is the non-interaction model, by the way. You're starting to catch on there in a bit. Uh, so, and then up here, I set centered water to one, the highest water level, only plot those plants grown at that level um, across the three values of shade. What I want you to see, this is the non-interaction model that I've done the triptych for so far. Notice that the slope is the same in every, every panel. Yeah, it's the same angle. Why? Because that's what a non-interaction model assumes, that the slope must be the same regardless of the value of the other predictors. Um, the intercept is changing. So it's picking up something important. As you add uh, water, it keeps going up, right? And that's true. As you add water to tulips, they get, their blooms get bigger. Uh, and that is happening here. Um, but the effect of shade is assumed to be the same in every case. Uh, and you can probably guess it isn't, right? Just look at the data uh, in that channel. It's not fitting very well. You can see this a hint of the interaction. Now let's plot the interaction model. Uh, and I can show you what happens. Same code, different model, right? Um, <coughs> at the lowest water treatment level, cross values of shade, uh, basically shade does nothing. Why? There's not enough water uh, for light to help. It basically does nothing at all. These, these plants are struggling to live. And you can water them as much as you want, but that isn't what they need, right? Uh, this is giving the starving man water, uh, in a sense. And, uh, or, or the thirsty man food, yeah, like <laughs> uh, sorry, yeah, thirsty man food, Thir thirsty plant food. And at the middle water level, um, cross values of shade, now we start to see the impact of denying them light. They've got enough water that they could viably produce some really nice flowers, uh, and then the ones grown in shade are, are performing worse. It hurts them, right? Because uh, bees are getting enough light to do something now that they've got some water to work with. And, uh, oh, I wanted to say about this, notice... It's probably not linear. Uh, this isn't a lot of data, but um, I, I suspect that there's nothing about tulips that forces them to obey linear uh, relationships between the needs for growth, right? Uh, especially near zero, it can't be linear, right? There's, you can't get smaller than a zero bloom, and this model will happily predict a negative bloom, uh, no problem. Um, and then at the highest water level, shade makes the most difference when there's the most water. Uh, it can do the most damage, and it can do the most help. Uh, but overall, these are bigger, right, because there's more water. But the difference between the, lo the lowest uh, shade level, which means the most light, and the highest shade level, the least light, is biggest here because the slope is steepest. And that's the effect of the interaction I was picking up. Does that make sense? It's easy to appreciate this with a plot like this. Uh, the coefficient table does nothing for you, right? There's like minus 50, okay. It's the minus 50 effect of shade or something. Great. But this tells you on the outcome scale what's going on, and this is what we want. And this is something your colleagues who aren't as deep into the navel gazing of your study system as you are, <laughs> they can understand, right? Yeah, question. Uh, what would you do if you didn't have just treatments with water? You just have to make a whole multiple You could, the question was, what if you had more of a gradient of continuous values of predictors? Same thing. There's nothing, the discreteness here doesn't matter. There's, it's still ordered. So it'll work the same way. If you have more possible values along the horizontal, works the same. Uh, you may want to pick, I mean, what you pick on the top, you have to make some decisions about which ones to put there. So it might be median, minimum, and maximum, or medium and, you know, like the lower 10% and the upper 90% or something. You have to make some decisions about where the bounds are, um, and you can explore a bunch of different ones. Uh, and then you decide which ones to present uh, based upon how they help your colleagues understand how the, what the model is saying. Does that make some sense? Uh, so would you just set the... Um Yeah. 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 Exactly. You could set the the sort of the unplotted predictor. You could set it to the mean, uh, whatever the mean is, and then you could set it to you know the five percent quantile of the distribution of that predictor too, right? So it'll have a minimum, uh, whatever the continuous range is. It have a minimum. You could put the minimum on the left here, the median in the or the mean in the middle, and the maximum on the right. The min and max I hesitate because they're often really extreme and uninformative. Um, you could try something else. I've already done this in a sense when I showed you with the ruggedness example, and I flipped it and I showed you uh, the effect of being in Africa depends upon ruggedness. I already did this because ruggedness is continuous, and there are a bunch of values, and I had to choose some. Uh, and I choose, I, I think, I forget what I chose, I think it was the 10%, 9% quantiles of it, or something like that. Um, 
But it depends upon your domain knowledge of the system. I don't think there's, the math doesn't tell us which values to show. It really doesn't. Wait, you can't plot Docker data. Well, you can with various yeah. tricks. So like in, in, in this case, it's easy because it's discrete. In that ruggedness example, I did do this by fading out. Uh, I used the alpha, what's called the alpha transparency of the colors. And I, there's actually a function in the rethinking package that I wrote to do this because I'm a nerd. Uh, but if you have a problem like that, send me an email, and, I'll, and we can play around with visual presentation and figure something out. But I like the idea you fade out uh, cases in the data that are far from uh, the uh, value on the top of the plot. Uh, well, there's no sort of right answer. It depends upon the nature of the data. Yeah? It doesn't matter which <coughs> variable you choose. Like, I could have plotted water not Right, right, right. The question was, it doesn't matter which you choose. We're going to do that next. We're okay. going to flip it and do Burden's ass again. Yeah, exactly. Right. Do you remember the Burden's donkey, maybe? I don't know. <laughs> the, Is that, on Tuesday? that was on Tuesday. Were you not here? Oh, okay. Sorry, though. No. All right. So, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. You, you looked shocked like, who is Burden? And <laughs> why are we talking about his ass? I don't know. Uh, that's the thing about this. this Greek Greek logical paradox, which is no paradox at all. No paradox is actually a paradox, right? <laughs> but uh, uh, so there, there's an ass, and, and it's hungry, and it's equidistant between two uh, piles of hay, and so it starves to death, right? Because it can't decide which direction to walk. And interactions, linear interactions, have no algebraic preference for which of these things you decide is conditional on the other, because they're symmetrically conditional. That was what we talked about on Tuesday, so. That was the callback joke to Bird and Scott. Yeah. Okay, we're going to do that now. Uh, oh, wait, no. First thing we're going to do is I want to show you, remind you, and you knew this, but centering doesn't change the predictions. It seems, and, and I, I want to emphasize this because it seems naughty, right? I like took the data and you transformed it by changing the mean. This, this, something's wrong, right? This, it seems like cheating. And there's this anxiety about it. It doesn't do anything. Absolutely nothing. Uh, neither does standardize. Uh, those are, those are non-destructive transformations that don't change any of the information in the data. Why? Because measurement scales are human inventions that don't really exist. <laughs> <laughs> right? Now, now I've outed myself as an anthropologist, right? So, find me a few beers sometimes and I'll, you know, we'll get into quantum physics really fast. But, uh, no, I mean, measurement scales are frustrating because they, they kind of get in the way of emphasis and we need them to collect data. But then the actual operation of the system in reality that is outside of the constructions in our heads we use to represent it can't depend upon the measurement scale because we invented that. It's just, it's like a linguistic construction. So uh, any kind of, in, anything that just rescales is perfectly kosher. Uh, and in fact, there's a whole, there's a very successful branch of analysis, mainly in the physical sciences, called dimensional analysis or dimensionless analysis, where you transform your model so that you get all the units out. All the measurement scales go away. Uh, and that is often the best way to analyze physical systems because, again, you want to get the human invention out of the model of the system. Uh, and, again, if I had five more weeks on a semester system, I would do uh, a day on that for you guys because there's some cool stuff you can do that way. But, um, uh, anyway, there's a – Cody. What if, like, you're taking, like, the log of something? So shifting the mean does shift. Oh, yeah. Log logs, uh, logs mean it's a different hypothetical relationship. When you take the log of a predictor and put that in instead – that, that, that means it's a different hypothetical relationship between the predictor and the outcome. Yeah. A multiplicative one, yeah. uh, actually. Uh, and often that's way more sensible in the business you and I do, yeah. right? To, to think that there's like a multiplicative relationship between money and some outcome rather yeah. than an additive one, right? Uh, that's a famous screwly thing, uh -huh. right? Uh, there was another hand, yeah. Um, what if you're using a measurement scale where zero has some important meaning that's important to the human being? Mm -hmm. Maybe if you don't have yeah, yeah, sure. The, the question was, why do you have a measurement scale where zero has some intuitive meaning? If you want to use it, go ahead. That's fine, too. I mean, the, the flip side of it is measurement scales are fine because they're inventions. Uh, and choose an invention that helps you understand what's going on. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, just saying, there's nothing wrong with using another one, too, as long as it doesn't change the information. Yeah. It's, so it does seem a little weird. But anyway, th so this is to show you um, – uh, uh, centering gives you all the same stuff. I'm just comparing on the top, the uncentered models with the, pr the triptych produced, and then the center ones on the bottom. All that happens is the exact values uh, for the predictors have changed. It's the same lines. You do have to be careful sometimes. If, if your priors take into account the measurement scale, and then you center or standardize your predictors, you can get different estimates if you don't also rescale your priors. 
Uh, this happened to somebody in here with a homework problem uh, at some point a couple weeks ago, actually. And it was a confusing at first. And then I realized, oh, you rescaled your predictors and your prior is still the same, but it should have different units too. And that's what happened, right? So you take that into account. Your prior has units. Uh, uh, so you have to keep that in mind. If your priors are really flat like they are here, you're not going to notice. Uh, but if they're informative priors, uh, that just means you have to you have to pay attention to what's going on. Okay. Um, yeah, some animation. All right. <laughs> they're the same. <laughs> um, all right. This is where we flip it and do the bird and thing. Okay, so on the top, uh, we do it the other way. Now we're going to take water and put that on the horizontal um, and put shade across the top. And again, I think uh, it's the same story, but this may be a, a different telling of it that, that re reveals something new to you about how it works. Um, and in th this example, I like it because it's really symmetrical, right? Uh, they go in opposite directions. So now we consider the question, water depends upon shade, and this triptych tells that story um, at low shade levels meaning there's a lot of light, increasing water helps a lot, right? So uh, at middle shade levels, increasing water helps less. Um, and at high shade levels, increasing water does almost nothing, almost nothing at all. So the question is, how does water depend upon shade? Um, water helps when there's a lot of light, when there's not very much shade, and then it has a big impact, right? And you knew that, right? That's why I use this example, to understand the biology. It's the same story as the bottom where shade depends upon water, all the same cases, all the same data are displayed, but in a different relationship. Now, shade depends upon water so that when we increase the amount of shade at low water levels, it makes no difference. Shade doesn't hurt. And anything that says it slightly helps, although you, know, you would just get excited about that. Right? And uh, oh, now at middle water levels, uh, shade hurts a little bit, um, and it definitely hurts a lot at high water levels. Uh, so you can see it both ways. Um, and it may be that you want to present both of these things when you do an analysis of the system. It depends upon what your questions are, what you're focusing on. So you can play around. When I do these models, I always compulsively do it all, uh, so I can make sure I understand what's going on. And part of that is just checking that I've done it all right. I'm, I did part of model checking to see that look for stuff that looks like my computer malfunction, right? Uh, and which happens to all of us. Um, does this make sense? Questions about this? Yeah. Okay. All right, uh, so interactions are not always linear. Uh, the ones we've looked at are. Uh, why are they linear? Because they represent a linear model of the coefficient that defines uh, the, the association between a predictor and the outcome. I'll say that again. They're linear because we use a linear model to define the coefficient that defines the association between a predictor and an outcome. As we take the ordinary linear regression model, there used to be a beta coefficient there, which was a parameter. We replace it with a model, and that model is linear. And it's a linear function of the other predictor variable. Right? And that's why it's a linear interaction. Um, and these things are geocentric. right? They're, they're really powerful descriptive engines. They're super useful, unreasonably useful, uh, given how goofy they are on the inside. Right? Uh, but I think there are lots of cases where you can do better by thinking a little bit about the biology um, uh, or the social dynamics of the system you work in. And uh, so let me give you an example in the context of this. We could add another kind of treatment variable to all these greenhouse experiments. Assume all the ones we've looked at so far uh, were grown at the ordinary cool temperatures that tulips like. Um, and, and tulips are uh, a high latitude flower. Uh, they're kind of winter rain flowering. Sort of thing at high latitudes, so that's why there's a Ronian coin with the tulip yeah. on it. <laughs> uh, that's where it comes from, and that's what they're associated with: lots of high, high altitude, uh, mid latitude blooming. So if it's hot, they don't bloom. Uh, this is this is why they grow them in places like you know Lompoc, California, and stuff like this, where it's cool all the time. And um, so you can imagine a greenhouse treatment where we really overheat the greenhouse, and none of them bloom, and all the bloom measurements are zero. And you don't have to get tulips too hot, I'm told, uh, before this is true. Uh, they'll, they'll come up and they'll just sit there forever waiting for the winter rain, <laughs> which never comes, poor sad things. And uh, someone actually sighed. That was great. <laughs> thank you. No, it was great. Thank you. That was like... <laughs> I'll try it. I'll try it. No, I love plants too. You know, like feel for them, right? It's like, come on, grow. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. So, all right. Um, yeah, so this is definitely an interaction. It's an interaction because the effect of water and shade depend upon 
the temperature, right? If, if it's too hot, neither of them matter at all in influencing bloom size. It's just zero. It flatlines. They have no effect. Try to construct that as a linear interaction. Uh, and in a moment, I'm going to show you how to do three-way interactions. So you'll see how you could do a potential three-way dependency among water, shade, and temperature. Uh, but I assert here, this is not linear, because what you want is a step function of some kind, where if the temperature gets high enough, the other variables don't matter at all, and it's just outcome is zero, and that's what you want to predict. And there are different ways to make models like that. So if you find yourself in a situation where you've got something like this, and, and your knowledge of the modeling conflicts with your knowledge of the biology, <coughs> give in to the biology and come talk to someone like me. And uh, that's what we want to do. I love projects like this, working with PhD students. If there's something about your system, and you know the biology, and you don't like linear regression, those are the problems that are fun. And uh, uh, you'll learn some modeling, and I'll learn some biology, and, and uh, everything will be great. Uh, but there are different options, so I'm not going to suggest exactly how to do this, but there will be different ways to do it. Um, uh, but linear interaction, uh, it'll probably pick up the dependency, but it'll make terrible predictions, right? Because it'll predict the continuous linear effect uh, of temperature change, which is not what happens <laughs> in plants. Okay, does this make sense? Yeah? Okay, I wanted to show you through interactions. Um, you can go with high order in interactions as you like. There's nothing special about, uh, about two predictor variables interacting. Uh, so remember, with uh, simple interactions we've seen so far, two predictor variables, they address the question, how does the influence, how does the association between one of these and the outcome depend upon the value of the other, and symmetrically, right, at the same time. Um, nothing wrong with three-way interactions, or even four-way, five-way. Uh, in theory, you can go as high as possible. In practice, you can't go very high. Uh, your computer will complain. But, um, and you'll lose your sanity. And that's one of the things I, I want to show you here. Uh, so, how do you do it? Uh, this is a three-way interaction model. Um, let me let me show you the anatomy of it a, a little bit. So, the first part to realize is we've just got three main effects. So we've got three predictors, creatively called x1, x2, and x3 here. So this is like water, shade, and temperature. Um, each has got their their ordinary coefficients in front of them. Then there are three two-way interactions. Uh, each of these addresses the the dependency of one on the value of the other, right? And there are three combinations of the, of the three um, uh, predictor variables, right? And then there's a term for the three-way interaction itself, which captures the three-way dependency. And so how would you even think about what that means? I'll have some examples in a moment. In the most abstract case, which will be unintelligible, but I have to tell it to you before I do the, the intelligible versions, it would be that the influence of x1, or the association between x1 and the outcome y, depends upon the interaction between x2 and x3. Joy, right? <laughs> and what is the interaction between x2 and x3? That is, that the association between x2 and the outcome depends upon the value of x3. Uh, okay, but, so it's like layers deep of interaction. And this is why these are hard to understand. You can plot these and still get it. Uh, biologically, what is this capturing? It's capturing the sort of thing like in the tulip heat example. Uh, if uh, one of these variables changes and it changes the, the interaction between the other two. It makes the interaction between the other two predictors depend upon the value of the third predictor. So the, the, the interaction between shade and water, which means how does shade depend upon water, right? How's the effect of shade depend upon water? That can depend upon temperature. So it's perfectly credible, and your systems may have things like this, but they're, they're pretty challenging to understand in, in the model form. And, but plot, with plotting, you can do it if you think you have to do this. Um, in, uh, they're very easy to specify uh, in code, though, so just showing you, if you're going to do it with map, you'd write it all out, right? Because I mean like that. That's sort of how it goes. But um, uh, with the automated formula tools in R, you just multiply them together, and this automatically implies all of the lower order terms in this. It'll, this is just the three-way one, but it'll, do, it'll populate all the possible two ways and the main effects as default when you do this. Um, and that's usually what you want, although not always. Later in the course, in a couple weeks, I think, um, we're going to have uh, an example where I take out a main effect in an interaction model uh, for theoretical reasons that we know it's zero, uh, and we're going to just remove it uh, a priori. Um, but, but that'll make sense when we get there. Does this make some sense yeah, for a moment? Let me give you a system. Well, I'm going to give you the warning about this first, and then I'll give you an example uh, to think about a little bit. So higher-order interactions 
um, are pretty risky for inference. They're hard to think about. They're easy to fit. Uh, you can get kind of drunk. If you've got a big data set, you can just put in like a big four-way interaction, and it'll be significant because you've got a lot of data, and then you'll report it, and you'll feel like a superhero. So you'll have no idea what's going on or how to explain it. Two-way interactions are hard enough to talk through, right? I've stumbled over my explanations over and over again, and I've taught this course a few times now. So, uh, but it's still hard to talk it through. Through your interaction is even more uh, confusing. So, you know, the, the interpretation issue is, is tough. It, a through interaction says, as I, I say here, it, it measures the extent to which the effect of X1 depends upon the value of X2 depends upon the value of X3. Dude, right? Um, I assume people get this joke, right? This, this is a good movie. It's a quality movie. <laughs> and uh, the bathtub scene especially is the best. <laughs> so uh, hard to estimate. Um, these are hard to estimate. You need a lot of data with higher order interactions because it's cutting up the data effectively into smaller and smaller little bits which are relevant to any particular parameter. Uh, and that means you get big, wide, uh, posterior intervals on those particular higher order interaction parameters. So there's not a lot of data relevant to calculate. Uh, and that's, that's the big lim information limitation. Also, there's this problem with multicollinearity, which we talked about before. Interaction terms are necessarily correlated with their main effects. I'll say that again. Interaction terms are necessarily correlated with their main effects. Why? Because they contain the same data. Right? It's necessarily so. So as you keep multiplying more and more predictors together, those correlations can escalate and be approach one shockingly quickly, uh, especially for dummy variables. Uh, so zero on indicator variables, say you have three of them, and this happens a lot in, in political science. So you've got a code like gender, race, and income bracket. And, and you code them as dummy variables with discrete values. Those things interact massively in the American electorate. Absolutely. And if you don't pay attention to those interactions, you can't predict how people vote, which is mainly what political scientists do, as far as I can tell. And <laughs> I know some are listening, so I'm just like taking on them, like, trolling them a little bit here. But, <laughs> but I think mainly like 90% of them do do that, which is fine. Someone's got to. Uh, so... Um, uh, as you multiply, uh, the only values are 0 and 1. As you start multiplying strings of those things together, they quickly approach being all 0. Why? Because it only takes one 0 to make them 0 forever. And then you can never get back out of there. 0 is a vortex, right? And then there, there's no variation in the higher order interaction. You're basically throwing in a vector that's got like 90% zeros and a few ones. There's almost no information in there. And it's highly correlated with the predictors that went into it in the first place. Uh, and often these things uh, generate, they have that left leg, right leg problem, right? It's redundant information uh, that's put in. You can get, make some progress here by regularization. That's the best thing uh, that you want to do. You can also standardize dummy variables. There's nothing wrong with that. I know it sounds creepy, but same thing applies. It's an arbitrary measurement scale. Take your zero one values, subtract the mean, and divide by the standard deviation. Perfectly cool, and it reduces the correlations. Because now there's just as much many values on the negative side as the positive side. And then you start multiplying negatives together, and uh, they flip sign, and all kinds of good stuff damps down the correlations. It's like algebra magic. But there's nothing wrong with it. It changes the geometry of the thing in a really useful way. So um, anyway, this is all to scare you, which is what I mean to do here. <laughs> uh, but if you really need these, sometimes you really do. So just think about it. If you do... Uh, Conditionality runs really deep in science. Uh, causal systems, uh, if you push them in their extreme in any particular dimension, the meaning of the other things change. And that's just how nature works. And that's part of the fun of studying it. So if you're working at one of those boundaries where you've got um, a system where it gets pushed there sometimes, uh, and you need to do this, then, then you need to do it. And uh, then it's fine. And uh, if you're scared about it, you can ask people like me to help you with it. Uh, ideally, your study takes it into account and gets uh, the amount of data you need to make it work. Um, power analysis is a great thing to do prospectively. Um, uh, but but uh, be aware that they're tricky. Okay, let me give you, last thing to say about interactions is, let me give you a thought experiment about through interactions. It's a data set that's built into the rethinking package. You're not going to work with it on the homework you're going to go home and take a look at, which is already up on the website. But you are going to do it next week. You're going to work with this next week. I love this data set. Uh, this is data from what's called the Judgment of Princeton, which happened in New Jersey uh, in 2012. And it's like the judge, famous Judgment of Paris, where they uh, uh, tested uh, California wines against French wines, right? And uh, California wines won, and then suddenly California wines were all over the world market. 
Um, so they had one of these in 2012 because there are a bunch of New Jersey uh, uh, wineries that are sure their wines are excellent. And uh, everybody else has that reaction. You know, laughing. <laughs> exactly. And uh, uh, so, but they, so they staged this. And this is blind testing. You get famous um, uh, wine aficionados and known wine judges, and they sit down and they sample the flights and they rate them numerically. All the data is in this wine's 2012 data set, uh, including the names, the unredacted names of the judges, which I mentioned because after the results came out, the French judges wanted their names redacted <laughs> because they liked New Jersey wine. <laughs> so, listen, they, did, they were never going to live that down. I think that's the best part of this story. Anyway, <laughs> yes, French judges preferred New Jersey reds to French reds. Uh, this is a shocking thing. Anyway, not by very much, by the way. You'll see the data. Uh, not, you're, you're, you'll analyze it in a couple weeks. Um, uh, so the outcome variable here is score, the rank, numerical ranking they gave the wine. And we have, as predictors, three um, binary ones. And they all matter. And, and there are interactions in these data that arise from them. Um, there's region uh, that the wine was grown in, whether it was New Jersey or France. Uh, the nationality of the judge. Right? You, can, you might be worried that that matters. Uh, and that's USA or France and Belgium, or there was a Belgian judge, which will count as France. It's like France with better French fries. Uh, <laughs> and I'm trolling a Belgian friend right now. <laughs> but, uh, and flight, uh, red or white, which were separated in scores. They didn't each separately for obvious reasons. So if you want to think through the meaning of these in the context of your system, you can verbally figure out what these interactions mean. So let's run through that exercise. And this is going to reinforce that when you know about your system and about its biology or the nature of the data, you, it's easier to make sense of this. And part of the, the, the trouble with this introductory statistics courses is they're taught often free of the context of your particular case. And so you've got to teach them in the abstract, and that makes it hard. It's the horoscopic problem, as I keep saying. So let's focus on these wines for a moment. And um, I'll assume that most of you know enough about beverages that you can understand uh, what's going on here. I assume you all drink wine like beer because you're in California. But... Um, the predictors are region, nationality of judge, and flight. We've, it's a three-way interaction, and burden's ass still applies. Right now, the donkey's got three piles of hay, and it can't tell the difference between them, uh, and it starves to death. So let's take them each in case and see the way you can interpret these interactions. First, there's an interaction uh, between region and judge, and we might call that the bias, right? Uh, the region the wine is grown in and the identity of the judge. Those things, the extent to which uh, the region affects score depends upon the judge. That's because judges are biased, right? They, they like different kinds of wine. New Jersey uh, judges like New Jersey wine, for example. Um, that interaction may depend upon the flight, whether it's red or white, right? So the nature of bias depends upon flight. Uh, make some sense? Um, I don't know if it does. And you'll analyze the data and let me know. <coughs> but, uh, interaction of judge and flight we might call preference, right? Judge, some judges really like reds, some really like whites. And this, this is true in the data. There are some judges who just like rate everything low, right? And um, that preference may depend upon the region the wine was grown in, uh, right? Make sense? So it's like this interaction depends upon the other thing. You assign that interaction a name that helps you understand it in the context of the system, then you can reduce it down to another binary thing to help you think it through. Um, the interaction of region and flight, I, I, I struggled to come up with any way to describe that, and I just settled on comparative advantage because it sounds smart. <laughs> but uh, let's say some regions, like New Jersey, are better at growing reds, which I think is probably true here. And uh, so you might say New Jersey has a comparative advantage in red wines. Uh, soil and, um, but that advantage depends upon the judge because not all judges see it the same way, like the same outcomes. Make sense? So this is the kind of thing you can do when you know your system, um, and you can go through and try to parse out this. And when you explain your results to others, this is really important, right? You get the summaries, and you say, okay, I drew all those plots, so what do we mean? What's the take-home message? Well, take-home message is uh, new, some regions have comparative advantages, but that comparative advantage just depends upon the judge's identity, right? Because they don't all see it the same way. They have different preferences. Yeah, makes sense? Okay. Uh, we're basically right on time, shockingly. Um, Okay, interaction is everywhere, and as we move forward uh, in the course, starting next week, um, we're going to have kind of a hiatus from new modeling types. Uh, there'll be no new modeling concepts, but we're going to get a new conditioning engine, a new way to fit our models, so a new way to draw samples from posterior distributions called Marco Chain Monte Carlo. 
And that'll let us deal with these uh, more complicated modeling types where interaction is always present, uh, whether you want it to be there or not, or whether you recognize it or not. Generalized linear models is what we'll do the week after next. And in generalized linear models, all the predictors interact to some extent, even if you don't explicitly put in interactions. You will still at various times. But and the reason is because um, the outcomes are bounded in generalized linear models in some way. They're not continuous uh, equal density spaces like in Gaussian models. So think about an outcome like survival. It's a zero one outcome that gets measured. You're modeling the probability that something survives. If some predictor is at a value such that the thing is almost certainly going to die, it doesn't matter that you add some additional threat. Right? Dead is dead. You can't be very dead. It's dead. It's like, one of the, it's like some cartoon, like kill them a lot, right? This is some cartoon saying. Uh, so it's these things happen. You can't kill it a lot. It's either dead or not. And that creates an interaction, right? The, the effect of poison depends upon whether it's dead or not. Right? <laughs> one easy way to think about it. So there's no avoiding uh, the case in GLMs. The interactions arise. And we all have ways to cope with that. So don't worry. Uh, it's okay. Um, and it, re it reveals, as, as I like to say, the majesty of nature in observing these crazy things. Because nature is full of, of uh, feedbacks of this sort. So, um, and then generalized linear multi-level models uh, are, are one way to think about them is their massive interaction engines. They let you take every parameter in the model and let it depend upon the identity of the unit that kind of produced it, whether that's an individual or a pond or a location, a uh, species, uh, whatever it is, you let the parameters, the effects, the treatment effects, uh, the average tendencies, you let them vary by those micro details in the data. And there's a lot of power that arises from that. We get better efficiency in estimation. It's the main thing I'm going to push when we finally get there. But you also get the ability to study variation, which is incredibly important, um, especially in observational systems where we can't squash the variation experimentally. We just have to embrace it and measure it and try to describe its consequences. OK. Um, I think I'm, I've got seven minutes, but I think I'll step a little early and just display King Markov. Uh, and when you return on Tuesday, I will pick up right here with King Markov. And we will visit his island kingdom and learn uh, how to do Markov Game Monte Carlo. All right? Thank you all.